Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you'll please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again for joining us this evening for our last school board meeting of this school year. You can believe that, right? Just a couple more days, I see some excitement in the front row. <laughs> time for some summer break, right? Get people some time to recharge and energize. Um, all right, so first on our um, agenda, is we'll go ahead and do the land acknowledgement. Jacqueline, do you have that this evening? Okay. Evergreen Public Schools resides on the traditional lands of the Chinookan peoples and the Cowlitz tribe. They have lived on and cared for this land and its waterway since time immemorial. We thank them for their stewardship and make this acknowledgement to open a space of recognition, inclusion, and respect for all indigenous students, families, and staff in our community. Thank you. All right, next. Uh, we will take a motion to adopt the agenda. We should probably also note that Ginny Gronwalt, our president, is absent this evening. I yep. move to excuse her. Second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 And then a motion on the agenda, please. I move to adopt the agenda as presented. Seconded. It's so moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. All right, next, this one's a fun one because I can see some great artwork in our boardroom and um, it's special recognition for the art awards. Corinne, you wanna come on up? Thank you for the opportunity for Karen Rivera and I to be here tonight to present to you our winners from the 35th annual district art show and share their art with you. This art show highlights the secondary art program in our district as well as the art discovery program that serves our elementary students. The district art show took place at the Cascade Park Library just down the road here uh, during the last two weeks of May. We were so happy to be able to have this event in person this year and we want to thank everyone that came. Uh, that, um, so we wanna just thank you for attending that. So we had art from every school represented in the show and then we had professional artists serve as judges, just as you would in a professional art show. These judges, with lots of thoughtful deliberation, picked the superintendent award winners that we will present to you tonight. So these pieces are purchased by the district and then they'll be displayed in our halls, hopefully this, by this summer. We also have two other award winners that we'll share with you this evening. So as I announce the students, uh, they'll come get their artwork here and they'll um, bring it here to share with you. And so if you have any questions or comments for them, uh, we'll, we'll do them one at a time. So, uh, oh, and Superintendent Boyd will present the ribbon to our six superintendent winners. So the high school winner of the superintendent award for 2D art is Somi Richardson from Mountain View High School. The title. <laughs> the title of the art is why is there a dog on the piano? I thought this was supposed to be realistic. <laughs> that is a great title. I mean, my eyes are older than I want them to be. You're very talented. Yes, the characters in Detailed. above the piano lid. What do they mean? Oh, it's a dog from a game called Undertale. Yeah, oh, I love Undertale. My kids, it's one of my favorites. Um, the, the Chinese characters. Or the oh, it means eternal silence, as in the dog will forever sleep on the piano and never play it. Oh. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Good job. Why do I get too big dramatic? Yeah, it is dramatic. It's really nice. It's fantastic. Such great composition. Do you want to put your art back over here? Karen will continue. 
the high school winner of the Superintendent Award for Photography is Devin Kirchifer from Heritage High School. His piece is called The Power of Light. The high school winner of the Superintendent Award for 3D Art is Anna Lauder from Union High School. <clears throat> this piece is untitled, but it's an animal skull with um, half of it cut away. It's, it's pretty amazing. That is yes. awesome. It's awesome. It's really cool. <laughs> The middle school winner of the Superintendent Award is Heidi Ginther from Shehala Middle School. <laughs> the title of this piece is Shades of Healing. Grade three through five winner for elementary school is Daphne Huber from Riverview Elementary. Her piece is called Birch Trees. It's beautiful. Is that so anywhere in the uh, in the world? Is it? A part of your experience or just great birch trees? Yeah, that's well, okay. Yeah. I love the colors. Do you like it in the leaves or do you do other things with it? Yes. Nice. I like it. Oh, so is that like watercolor? Is that? It's nice. <laughs> And our last superintendent award is the grade K through two winner for elementary school. And this is for Aubrey Moe. <clears throat> Aubrey is from Riverview Elementary and her piece is called The Sunflower. Sure. Great job. <laughs> Pretty, I like it. <laughs> so we have two other awards that, that we present. These are not purchased by the district, but they're special recognitions that have been chosen out of all of the entries. Uh, one of them is called the Mary Kamak Award. And this was named after um, an energetic, positive, and vivacious lady that would light up any room she walked into. She was a district office curriculum specialist. And this award was instituted by the district staff in memory of Mary and her advocacy for art in the Evergreen Public Schools. The recipient of this award couldn't be here tonight, but it's Elliot Patton from Mountain View High School. And our last award is the Sharon Springer Award. This was our, uh, Sharon Springer was our first district level art discovery coordinator. 
Uh, she developed the program, expanded it throughout the district, creating the format as it exists today. This award is given in her memory to one elementary art piece that represents the spirit and joy of elementary art education. So the recipient of the Sharon Springer Award is Egypt Brown from Orchards Elementary. Great job. <laughs> and that's all we have for you. Thank you so much for um, allowing us to be here to share these great um, award winners with you. Thank you. I'm always. <laughs> I just wanted. I just wanted to say. Am I on? <laughs> I just wanted to say how impressive every year we, we see examples of just incredible art by our students. And I'm just so proud of, of the kind of work that they do. And I, as someone who works in kind of an artistic industry, I hope that you all keep that passion for your creativity and use it in your future endeavors as well as just for your enjoyment because you all are doing just beautiful work. Thank you so much for bringing it to us tonight. If I just, if I could add, if I could add just one thing. Um, so what, one of my favorite things about coming to district office has always been, even when we were in our old facility, is going through the halls and looking at the art on um, the walls from years and years. And talk about legacy building, right? Your artwork's gonna be in our hallways for a really long time and it's amazing. And I'm not an artist, so I appreciate it because I, there's no way I could do any of that. So congratulations to all of you. <coughs> all right, next up is the board consent agenda. Uh, we will entertain a motion for approval. I move for approval of the board consent agenda. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. We have aye. Item. Oh. John was going to read something before. No. Super superintendent one. Oh, the superintendent's consent. Yeah. yeah. Aye. Okay. Aye. All right. Next up is the superintendent consent agenda and I think that John has something yes wants thank to add. you I would like to address the board related to the consent agenda before you take action on it as you know from the written report provided um, by me to you previously I've recommended the non-renewal of our provisional employees uh, one of those provisionals employees name is Charlotte Latte Latte and Miss Latte has provided some materials for you uh, for your consideration it is important that you each acknowledge that you have considered her materials before taking action on my recommendation uh, through the approval of the consent agenda. All right, thank you, John. So do, do we uh, maybe just go make sure that everybody has had a chance to review the materials? Rob, have you re reviewed the material? Yes, I have. Jacqueline? Yes, I have. Victoria? Yes. And I have as well. You just make a okay. motion to. All right. So with that, uh, do we have a motion for the superintendent consent agenda? So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Well, thank you. I, I want to, in my superintendent report here, um, so many great things happening in the district. The art show is one of them. Uh, we just finished uh, graduations. It was uh, phenomenal uh, spirited uh, occasions that we had with our graduates. A few black uh, backflips on the stage, but uh, uh, we survived it. And it was, there was just so much love and beauty in those. Uh, uh, and the ability for us to do those in person was uh, really uplifting to me. And I certainly appreciate the board going to all seven of them as well. 
Um, and uh, I do want to draw your attention to a couple of things. One, we've got two days of professional development planned for our principals. We're really trying to phase in the launch of our strategic plan by resetting and recalibrating around that most important thing that we do, and that's the learning partnerships, the partnership between the student and the teacher. So we're going to work with our, our principals and do some professional learning related to that and get our compasses aligned together so we can start rowing uh, together to get some equitable outcomes for our students. So really excited. I'll be personally um, facilitating the first day, and then we have a host of folks helping along the way. So really excited about that. Uh, we do have an upcoming um, interview process for our deputy superintendent. Um, uh, we are, we're, we've done some screening, and we'll be ready to uh, share that uh, process with the board. I know we have a couple of board, actually three board members that have expressed interest. We have to narrow it down to two. Uh, so we'll have to have that conversation and we'll get uh, folks involved in that. We have a four part process, uh, one of which is a panel of um, students, another of which is a presentation they have to do some, to some of our district leaders, an interview process, and then we're gonna allow each uh, individual candidate to have 30 minutes via Zoom um, uh, with Dr. Miner to before the process so they get a sense of the position because as much as we're trying to see if they're a fit for us, we also want to uh, motivate and encourage them uh, if we do make an offer to say yes. So uh, that's part of our strategy there. Again, the graduations were stunning. I really enjoyed those. Uh, just uh, beautiful, uh, loving, uh, wonderful ceremonies, and I was happy to take part of that. Um, I did my last down with the last sit down with the superintendent just to recap the year, and um, also a couple of things. I, I do want to. Uh, make kind of just a, a quick statement about the loss of our equity specialists. Um, this has been a tough thing. Uh, we had to reduce uh, 200 positions. Among those were our equity specialists. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the hurt and the pain in the community uh, related to the, the loss. I also think it's important for us to acknowledge the phenomenal work that they've done to get us this uh, to this point in our equity journey. I also just want to say that I know this board and conversations that we've had uh, individually and collectively is 100% committed to our equity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion work, and we're going to continue to lean into that and uh, work hard to, uh, to make equity work in, in a way that is everybody's job. Um, it's a, a, a loss for us, uh, uh, losing these equity specialists, but I'm absolutely confident uh, that we'll move forward in the most productive way related to our equity work. Um, I also want to uh, just thank Bill Bevel. This is your last, uh, is this your last one, Bill? So oh you can see <laughs> Bill has a Hawaiian shirt for every day of the year, I think, and he wears a new one, and this is his special last board um, Hawaiian shirt uh, that he's sh sharing with us. But just want to, you know, as board president, um, it's a tough job. And often we're at opposite sides of the table, but we always know that Bill's advocating for his folks in the most uh, professional and, and productive way for everybody focused on kids. And we thank you for your four years of a service in that department. And so I'd love to just give you a hand to, uh, to, to thank you. Um, last thing is, uh, this is also the last uh, board meeting for Dr. Rebecca Miner. And uh, Rebecca is transitioning to the new superintendent, interim superintendent of the Edmonds School District. I just, on a personal note, um, I, I told her my job is going to be a lot easier when she's gone uh, because she challenges me uh, and in good ways. Uh, she's, I've learned lots working with her. I've really enjoyed it. And we've had, you know, a, a levy failure and passing uh, some budget cuts, some real challenges associated with this. And I could not have imagined doing that in this stretch without Rebecca. And so, Rebecca, um, just want to personally thank you as well for your service and wish you the best of luck as you move forward to uh, New Horizons yourself. And that's all I got. All right. Thank you, John. All right. Next uh, department update, uh, teaching and learning equity update. Is Clarissa giving us the update this evening? Oh, Rebecca? Re oh. And then? They might be going up together. They're teammates. <laughs> <laughs> Just do what Clarissa says, that's the way it goes. 
All members of the board, Superintendent Boyd, it's a pleasure to be here for a final time with you this evening. Um, this has been a really busy few weeks, as you can imagine. In addition to supporting the um, busyness and excitement of schools during this time, the team's been incredibly busy trying to get ready for those two days of professional development we have coming up uh, with principals. We've all been inspired by um, John's vision for those days, as he said he's going to take on the first day. And then Ruth Beggs and I have been working hard to get a second day prepared where we will be um, jump-starting our work for next year. Um, our school improvement efforts with um, celebration, reflection, and research to move our work next year forward. We're also planning an additional day, um, which we'll leave for John to, or I will leave for John to implement for our operations staff. And this will be something new that we'll have about a, you know, two to three hours with them, where they will get to see how their departments, whether that be transportation, food service, fit into the daily lives and the experiences of our students. And there's lots of great research out there about how um, a bus driver can tremendously impact a sense of belonging that a student feels. And so just really welcoming them into this work and inviting them to um, talk and reflect more about their role in school improvement. So I think that'll be an exciting addition this year. We had an end of year coaches collaboration tea. And at that, it, our coaches and administrators came together to celebrate the work of the coaches and their role in the schools and to um, think more about as we become warm demanders of our students, how we can increase our warmth, making them feel welcome in our schools, and also the expectations that both we hold for them and that they hold for themselves. We know one of the highest measures um, that helps school improvement is that everyone has a sense of collective efficacy and then we also have high expectations for our students. Um, plans are underway for the implementation and training around the math adoption which you completed recently and we're excited to have that opportunity. One of the things that's going to happen on John's day is uh, we're going to get to experience that math curriculum a little bit and get to play with it so that everybody um, in the schools and on the teaching and learning side will have a sense of that math and um, also working on the Canvas rollout so that we are working on the implementation of a common student learning, a learning management system which will allow us to communicate with parents and families at the secondary level in a consistent way across the board and we're very much looking forward to that. Finally, just on a personal note, as John indicated, this is my last meeting in Evergreen. I just wanna say what an honor and privilege it has been to be a part of this district. Um, Staff have been incredibly welcoming, they've been insightful, and really their focus on improving outcomes for all students has been an inspiration to me. Um, it's been a pleasure to serve under Superintendent Boyd. I've learned a tremendous amount for him at, from him as he works for cohesion and coherence in our system. And I know that he has the very best possible outcomes for students at the forefront of every decision he makes. And so that's been just tremendous for me to be a part of. And I just wanna thank the board for this opportunity to serve in Evergreen. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Clarissa. Hi. Okay, let me plug in. And I have your slide too. Okay. It is not working. <coughs> let me know if I need to press new buttons. Um, <coughs> So I thank you all for having me this evening for the equity update. I, I did it wrong. I did it wrong. Oh. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I am going to be um, uh, sharing with you uh, in three different ways on this evening. Um, but all of it is in celebration of the work that we've been able to do on this year. And so the first thing um, that you'll hear is you're going to hear um, from students. Um, and then you're going to hear about celebration of work that we have been doing for the students. Um, and then the final thing is, is I, I, I'm going to share with you a setup um, uh, so you can hear from a particular student. And what she... Um, what she did to advocate for something that she didn't see and what the response was to that. Um, because it is a, um, 
it's, it helps us see into the future, into the creative ways in which we're gonna be able to continue with equity in our district. So um, the first thing is, as you all know, the two years is up for our equity, our equity advisory committee. They have, we've become a family along these two years. Um, we've been able to produce some really excellent um, things for you all in, in advising um, on things as they relate to equity. Um, there are, there is a make or a project um, draft for each of the subcommittees for our equity advisor committee. The safe update that you're gonna hear in a moment is our student subcommittee. There's also work from our parent subcommittee, our certificated staff subcommittee, and our admin subcommittee. Um, that is work that I'll be sharing with the superintendent and he will share with you. Tonight, I'd like for you to hear from members of our safe community about what they, our safe committee, about what they um, were able to do um, in their short time together this year, um, as they would like to share that with you with their own voice. So, get their thing ready to go. Okay, and coming up. All right, um, hello everyone. My name is Susan Hong. I will be a senior at Mountain View High School next year and I was the founder of the SAFE Committee. So SAFE stands for Students Advocating for Equity and today I'm here with my planning committee to talk to you about a little bit about what we've done this past year. All right, so um, a quick rundown on what SAFE is. So basically, SAFE was the brainchild of the District um, Diversity, and Equity, and Inclusion Committee. And it came when we realized that it was really difficult for students to share their voices with, especially when um, adults were present. And so we decided to create SAFE as a platform for students to amplify their own voices and talk about issues related to equity that they cared about and that affected themselves. So without further ado, um, some of our planning team members will be here to share with you some of the specific accomplishments that our group was able to accomplish. Um, hi, my name is Shuhei Lee, and I'll be a senior at Union High School this year, or next year. Uh, I led group one with the help of Susan and our wonderful adult advisors. So our group, we, just, or we identified the main issue um, about the lack of resources available for the diverse like, range of students present in our schools, especially in regards to bathrooms in which they felt safe and um, comfortable using. And so our goal was to establish gender neutral bathrooms at schools across the district and to do uh, or to work towards this we talked with Ms. Seinbrenner about the actual feasibility of um, building gender neutral bathrooms and incorporating them into our school buildings. And so, um, yeah. Hello, my name is Riley Taft and I will be a senior at Mountain View High School. Hi, I'm Tanya Chintalpati and I will be a senior at Union High School. And we have our leading group, group two. So the goal of group two was to establish a curriculum that accurately and respectfully portrayed the diversity of Evergreen School District's community. Through the work that we put in uh, during our short time working with SAFE, our group has been working towards incorporating student voice into the instructional materials committee. And this includes talking about different ethnicities and cultures in our everyday learning to spread knowledge about the what the wide diversity of students that we have in our district and in our community. Hello, I am Ava Weatherspoon, and I will be a senior at Mountain View High School. Hi, my name is Rena, and I am also gonna be a senior next year at Mountain View High School. And together we led group three. Mm -hmm. And for group three, our main purpose was to create a system of support for students who have experienced uh, the three 
main issues experienced by students today, which will be sexism, racism, and bullying at schools. But at the same time, we also wanted to support the staff by creating a positive learning experience where students will feel safe and comfortable to oppress, express their opinions. Having identified that goal, we would like to create a plan to teach our members and students of all ages about mul the multi-tiered systems of support, or MTSS. And with that, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Any quick questions for the students before we go on to celebrations? I just wanted to say that um, I was able to work with these students um, for the last, I guess it's been about six or seven months that you've been working on this. And I'm very proud of all of you. And you've done a great job and you've um, surfaced a lot of issues. And I know that you guys, I think you guys have some plans to continue on with this next year, correct? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> great, good, great job, guys. All of this has been very important work and I appreciate you taking the time because I know all of you probably have pretty busy schedules on top of this. Um, and so the work you've done, though, is really important for us as we start thinking about our equity work and, and move this forward. So thank you for everything you've done to support that. I ha thank you as well. But I, I actually had a question, because um, Riley and Tanya talked about student voice in the Instructional Materials Committee, and uh, that's an idea that I don't think any of us have ever had, and that coming from you uh, is really sparking some curiosity for me. It's like, how could we introduce student voice into that particular structure? Uh, I love the idea of teaching students about MTSS and what's available to them. And I appreciate your work, and I'm looking forward to how you continue it. I just want to thank you for your courage in embarking in this work, and uh, and thank you for supporting your fellow students. Um, it's admirable, and I really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank you. It sounds like you're going to do some celebrating together. <laughs> <laughs> you earned it. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, I'd like to share with you some um, end of the year celebrations from our um, department. I'm going to do this in a different way because I like graphics and pictures. So there are probably hundreds of things that I could say that are celebrations as to what we were able to accomplish this year. Um, many people have echoed the sentiment of the, you know, this, is, this has been a roller coaster year. Um, you know, not just from January to June, but before then as well. And so the fact that um, all of this awesomeness was able to still come out um, in support of students is something that I want to celebrate. So here are the seven things that I'm going to highlight. The first being, um, we were able to offer um, paraeducator support via PD. Um, our paraeducators also wanted to embark upon this journey about learning how to have courageous conversations with folks about um, supporting students better. And so what we did was our specialists, so that's both our equity and SEO specialists, helped to facilitate 10 hours of professional development for approximately 100 paraeducators over four months. Um, and this professional development is gonna help them be able to engage in that foundational, the same foundational professional development that our teachers and administrators had um, on next year. The next thing is that our, both our equity and SEO specialists completed a very rigorous um, Courageous Conversation Practitioners program where they got to do some deep study about the protocol and how to utilize it with folks who have all kinds of backgrounds and beliefs and, and to use the tool in order to have in difficult conversations with colleagues and perhaps even in their personal lives. So they completed that on at the end of last month. Our third key celebration is the professional development that we've been able to provide on demand via Canvas um, for our staff because we know that sometimes we can't get them all together at the same time, but we want them to have that information at their fingertips. This professional development included um, uh, familiarity with the Ready for Rigor framework, so that's Zaretta Hammond's work with culturally responsive teaching. 
um, SEL best practices, as well as the uh, HIP lessons that we share with you halfway through the year um, that many of our secondary schools implemented to help um, students learn how to better uh, advocate and express themselves that did not end with harassment, intimidation, or bullying. The fourth thing are our affinity spaces. So we, we started those on last year. We were able to expand those on this year. Both our equity specialists and SEO specialists helped to facilitate those on a monthly basis, and we had spaces for staff, parents, and students. Additionally, um, we have some student-centered re-engagement. Uh, this is more towards the second part of our year, but uh, our attendance specialists our community enrichment and engagement coordinator in collaboration with our, our equity and SEO specialists conducted some empathy sessions with students around what it is that causes um, students to disengage from school, which adversely affects their attendance. And so since they're the ones who are living that, we thought we'd go to them and get their input on how to increase engagement um, as well as attendance. Um, and so they provided some input for us on how to move forward with um, those efforts. And that was a collaborative effort with um, pretty much every person in our department um, and schools as well. The sixth, that CSCP is our comprehensive school counseling plan. And that is something we kicked off this year to support um, our counselors in crafting, right? So they have to, their crafting begins next year, but there's a lot of professional development and time that goes into crafting that plan. And our SEL um, specialists are the ones who helped us be able to do that for our counselors on this year. And finally, <laughs> um, school leader and staff support. This is multifaceted. It came through different ways, not just professional development. But I can, I can say that every one of our school principals um, was supported, as well as over hundreds of teachers um, received that direct and indirect support from our specialist, and not limited to, but in these uh, areas, one of which is the high school and middle school equity team PLCs. There's also um, consult that our specialists was, were able to do, uh, as well as Jamila and myself. Um, but then there, beyond our leaders, our staff was also able to tap in um, to our specialists to help them improve where they are, their instruction to better support students. And so those are the seven celebrations that I wanted to share with you. Again, there are many, um, but these are the ones that I wanted to highlight. All right, and finally, oh, y'all saw my notes. I love notes. Um, I begin with students. We celebrated work for students, and now I'm going to end with a specific student. Um, so I'd like for you to, I'm going to set you up. You're going to hear from Brooke a little bit later, but I, I want to I wanna introduce you to Brooke. Um, I learned about Brooke um, based on some advocacy that she was able to do, and so I want to make sure I capture very specifically that, and you will hear from her a little bit more later. So. Brooke is the embodiment of the level of student advocacy that we'd like to see. Um, we as a system do very intentionally work to elevate student voice in productive ways. Um, so Brooke here attends Pioneer Elementary and she is in Ms. Poling's fifth grade class. You will hear from her a little bit later during the citizen comments as she continues to use her voice in a productive way as a young citizen of our community. Brooke saw a need in the texts that she was provided um, in her classroom. She shared that need with her teacher. Her teacher encouraged her to reach out to our curriculum and instruction department, and our curriculum and instruction department responded in an impactful way. Brooke here is a wonderful example of not only advocacy, but advocacy in support of inclusivity and dignity. She is a model for her peers and adults. And what, what you will hear from her is the example or a model for equity, right? This is what equity is all about. And so we look forward to in our department and across our district as we all lean into being equity leaders, 
new and creative ways to ensure that every student gets what they need to be successful. That is all that I have for you this evening. Are there any questions? I just wanted to say thank you to you and Jamila and your staff for all the ways you support students and all you've done this year. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. Thank you. It's good work. I'm glad that you're taking some time to recognize and celebrate and think about all the accomplishments that have happened over the past couple of years. Yes. It's they are numerous. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you, Clarissa. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up, uh, good news report. Is Craig here this evening? Here he comes. Lots of good news this time of year. Lots of fun stuff. We're going to try to connect correctly. I've got it connected. Sorry, it's the HDMI. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did not learn from you, Clarissa. <laughs> I mean, I've learned with, from you from other things, but not this one. Well, thank you very much. I always love this part where I get to share the good news. And I will start with, the, of course, the best news of the month were the graduations, uh, the seven graduations that we had. And you, you were all there along with Superintendent Boyd. I did want to mention that all seven of our graduations were uh, broadcast live on our YouTube channel. And they were also broadcast uh, with our partnership with Comcast and TV, et cetera. So they were available there. And uh, they're still available now on our YouTube channel. So people. Uh, we saw people watch from all over the country, so that was great. Uh, I want to start with another ceremony that we had um, this month, and that was over at Mill Plain Elementary School, where we had the groundbreaking ceremony, and this was the first time in a while that we were able to do it with the entire school there. Um, I know Julie um, Bocanegra, Jacqueline Witherspoon, and uh, John Boyd were there. Uh, the kids were just awesome. Uh, we had student speakers and uh, the weather held out just enough and they were under the covered play. Uh, we have a video. Uh, we actually have the full ceremony available on YouTube and also a highlight video um, about two and a half minutes to, to show all the excitement and uh, uh, a lot of cheering. Uh, go Mountaineers. Um, I then wanted to share a couple of walking events that we had, because those are things that I hadn't seen since I've been in the district. And the first one was uh, Crestline Elementary School walked right over here to our neighbor, uh, the Cascade Park Community uh, Library. So they walked from their school to the library, where there they uh, signed up for library books and uh, learned how to look for books and find books in perfect preparation for the summer. So they're set to read this summer. Uh, the second one, we've already ta uh, shared some of our great artwork. Um, Seize the Bagel, which has uh, just been a great supporter of our school district. Um, they had an exhibit of art from Riverview Elementary School. And the, the students there walked from Riverview uh, to Seize the Bagel and got to see their art on the walls. They also got a coupon for a bagel. Uh, we had a lot of our district uh, administrators there, uh, including Scott Monroe. Uh, and just a, a wonderful thing. And th that art was there all month long at Seize the Bagel. Um, uh, we've got a lot of events, so I've got to scroll down to uh, the next one. I want to, to celebrate our, uh, our Covington uh, Colts uh, Middle School Band. Um, the Rose Festival, of course, just, uh, just going on. And uh, the marching band was able to take part in the Rose Festival Junior Parade on just June 8th, 2022. And they did a great job. And it was awesome to see them out there and be part of those uh, festivities. Um, I do want to share that we have, in community relations, we have been uh, going to every single school to share their end of school events. So you see so many of them. And I want to share one of, uh, one of the, the great things that I think we do in this district is the, the grad walk, where um, graduating seniors visit elementary schools. And they have their robes and you know, their, their hats. And they, they walk through the school. Uh, and they're treated like you know, superstars, which is great for the seniors. But it's also great uh, for the elementary school kids to see our seniors graduating and kind of uh, think about you know, where they want to be in a few years. So uh, some wonderful pictures from, from these events. And I do encourage everyone to go to our Facebook page and uh, Instagram to see all the, the events from around our district. Um, 
Of course, this time of, of year is the time when uh, scholarships and, and staff recognition. And um, the Evergreen School District Foundation uh, recently honored Christy Dunn, a math teacher at Heritage High School. Uh, she won the Educator of the Year Award. Um, the great thing about this award is that it's a surprise. So you kind of show up to her classroom and boom, uh, all these people walk in, including Superintendent Boyd, uh, Principal Derek Garrison, and award her uh, with a $500 check for school supplies for her school. So as you can see in these pictures, it was, uh, she even got the mascot there and um, just an overwhelming uh, response on Facebook for this, seeing so many of her former students comment on what an amazing teacher she was. We had over 300 uh, engagements on this, which is a lot for us. And then uh, finally, I, I wanted to mention our own uh, Lori Stroll um, at Evergreen High School to honor her son, Jason Thomas Kaipo Moy. Um, her family gives out a memorial scholarship in honor of her son who passed away in 2012, and it goes um, to an Evergreen High School uh, basketball player. Um, they get $1,000 scholarships towards um, their next step in education, uh, whether it's a trade school or um, to a college environment. And uh, this year, um, Lori Stroll and her family uh, did two scholarships, and the two award winners were DJ Edmondson Jr. and Carmelo Stewart Turner. And uh, I was lucky enough to take these pictures and uh, see the smiles on their faces when uh, Lori gave them those scholarships. So uh, that was very special. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank Any you questions? for highlighting that. We love that. Oh. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. All right, uh, next on the agenda is information items. Uh, the first one is the Alternative Learning Environment Board Reports. So our ALE Board Reports. Is this just open for any questions or comments, John? Yeah, it's just written reports for your review and um, if there's any questions or comments, let me know. Anybody have any questions or comments on the ALE report? There's one here for uh, Home Choice Academy and then one for Legacy High School. <clears throat> and I think I, these are just I, required yearly for our review. Yeah, um, I could ask about Legacy Online and uh, we know we've been serving about, I think four times as many students over this year than previously. Uh, and wondering uh, as we get into the next school year, what that will look like uh, for students who may still want and families who may still want the online option. Yeah, we're making both available and the demand is strong. It continues yeah. to be strong. Maybe not quite as strong as it was in the middle of the, of the height of the COVID surge, but um, we're fully staffing it and expecting it to be fairly similar in terms of uh, enrollment for both programs. Thank you. I just, I just wanna comment on um, legacy in particular. <clears throat> Um, there was a time when legacy was, I don't even want to, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was just not a school that I, I personally as a board member felt was a good place for kids because the graduation rate was so low and the number of kids graduating, I mean, and then this weekend when we had the legacy graduation and I saw all those kids graduating and just, um, I just, have Rob take a picture and send it to a former board me member that used to worry about that school quite a bit and she was so thrilled to see how successful that school is becoming and it's just been amazing to see the growth there so it can it's so doable and they are a prime example of how you can turn things around High expectations for all students and a lot of love care concern and support and uh, they live it and breathe it there and uh, really impressive numbers of graduate students out of an alternative program for students that want a different experience. I couldn't agree more. Is Heather here? I don't know. In the audience? Okay, because I got to give her like total credit for that turnaround for sure. So we're lucky we have her to help us with all of our high schools now. Great. Uh, if there aren't any other questions on that one, the next information item is the financial statements. 
I know that we're probably busy with budget stuff for the coming year, and then we'll have more information about that this summer. But if there's any questions for the financial statements. Same format as the last item. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a projection for the um, reserves that we're setting aside for the next school year? How three significant digits or so, how much money is that? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I said, how much? How how much is in the reserves plan for next year at this point? Well, the plan is to uh, maintain a five percent or more fund balance. So, the budget reductions that were made, um, the twenty million dollars of cuts that we made, were reflective of our desire to maintain that five percent. Mm -hmm. And I think that represents. Um, Je Jennifer doesn't like me spouting out numbers, but I think. <laughs> She gets really concerned. Somewhere in the $29 million, well, she's not her head, so in the $29 million amount of money um, is close to that 5% minimum fund balance. So, you know, once the all everything shakes out from the end of the year, we'll know more precisely what that number is, but that's what we're shooting for. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to board comments. So this is comments by the school board. If anybody has anything they'd like to add, I know we've had um, we had a busy weekend, which is a lot of fun. I want to say that um, this was my first time being a part of graduations and attending all seven ceremonies. Um, it was incredible. Each school was unique and special, and it was just I was honored to be a part of it and to be able to be there with the students and the families. I was just uh, telling uh, some coworkers today at a meeting, because they asked me about graduation, and I said, it doesn't matter how many graduations I attend, it's that first note of pomp and circumstance, mm -hmm. and the kids, when they first start to walk in and the crowd raising, that, that feeling is amazing every single time. It never gets old. Yes, yeah, graduations, yeah, fill your cup. It's, it's good to see how many successful. I ask each principal every year how many are there and uh, ask them to speculate on how many, what percentage that is. And I think we actually had one of them report out to the entire audience that 95% graduation, that was Evergreen, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. that they're mm -hmm. projecting a 95% graduation rate. And given the way the law is uh, and who has to be kept on the rolls in order not to get lost, that's pretty close to everybody that has ever come to school um, <clears throat> over those four years. I think we found uh, a number of years ago that if, uh, a, if a kid's, if a student's home life is stable enough that they can come to the same schools for the years uh, that they graduate. And that's uh, just really remarkable to me that uh, that, that kind of thing can happen. Um, I did want to talk a little bit, because we didn't, we didn't take an opportunity, uh, given what had happened, to talk about what all had gone on. But we had, I think, the Children's Culture Parade, um, which was wonderful. Victoria and, was it just you and me this time, Vic, with, with John? I'm John. It's so nice to have that back and have, it was fun. you know, several hundred children shouting huzzah and saying the Pledge of Allegiance in unison. That has always been such a good uh, a good moment for me. And uh, uh, beyond that, uh, is we had the at your service dinner or lunch, uh, which uh, it was my first time there. Uh, and it was really nice. To, I, I don't know if I've got the training down uh, to eat at a fancy uh, French English restaurant because I learned all my manners in Germany. Um, and that's different. So I learned some things about how to fold a napkin and, and, uh, uh, met four really nice, really good kids. I just, all of those experiences just underscore how little I fear the future with those people uh, rising uh, into their adulthood. It just injects so much confidence in I'm our world. I'm glad they have that program back because I went to it several times in the past and it was always so eye-opening. <laughs> and, and the conversations with the students there was just always priceless. Um, mm -hmm. 
they enjoy it so much and they are just they're just fun to talk to but um i'm glad you got to do that yeah um did you have anything else i did because uh mountain view uh made good on an event for alumni to walk through those classrooms before the school uh, is demolished. We got to talk about an experience uh, and, and get answers about which of those senior gifts were moving over uh, and which couldn't be and how they're going to archive it. And, and they're working very hard to preserve that 40 year, I think it's 40 years of, uh, of that high school and make sure that those items come over in one form or another to the new school so that the continuity remains. We aren't um, opening a new school. We're giving a very successful school a new building. And uh, just being able to meet and see all people that I haven't seen in decades, uh, some of them who flew in from the East Coast just for this, that was neat. It was really neat, and it was a really good send-off for us as alumni. Now I'm done. <laughs> Um, Ginny and I um, attended the last DELT meeting, mm -hmm. um, our leadership for equity and diversity, and um, it was emotional for everyone that participated. It was, you know, it was a challenging co conversations, but good conversation. So <clears throat> I always appreciate that group a lot. and. Um, they're part of that, that whole leadership piece that, that needs to help us all move forward. So I look forward to that group every time, even when it's hard. Yeah. Anything else? I just want to take uh, just a couple minutes to, we talked about graduation and all the celebrations that have been happening, but I want to thank, um, our graduations are fantastic because we have a great team working out there and our, um, Shane and the security team that have done a fantastic job because it's a lot of people in and out of that place over the course of three days. Um, so I want to thank them. And I also want to just thank all of our staff um, for a great school year. I know it's not been easy, um, but everybody has pulled together. And whether you're working at one of our schools or at the administrative office, office just thank you for your hard work and um, doing the right thing for our students. All right, uh, next up is future agenda items. I know that we have been working on um, getting some planning meetings for this summer um, and some uh, agenda items for that. So if there's something that you want to make sure that we discuss at, at one of those, make sure you bring it forward. Right. Is there anything that you wanna? I'm gonna have to think about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just think about it. Just email Jenny or myself or yeah. John. Okay, next up is uh, public comments. Uh, any community member wishing to address the board may do so during the time on the agenda for public comments. As long as the comments are not personnel related or about an individual employee or student and are not legal in nature. Each speaker will be allowed three minutes to address the board. Comments are to be directed to the board of directors as a whole and may not be addressed to any individual member of the board, administrative staff, or the audience. Please state your name and district affiliation, if any. And we've got some folks that are signed up. Uh, we do have one virtual attendee, so we're gonna start there. And it's Ashley Cooper. Ashley, are you there with us? Hi there, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Good, thank you, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, and this is my, my son, Storm, he wanted to join. <laughs> That's great, future student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get started. Um, good evening. I'm Ashley Cooper, one of the equity advancement specialists that recently was non-renewed. You have heard from my colleagues, but have yet to hear from me. I appear before you now to speak my truth, honor my dignity, and control my narrative. I prefix this truth by being transparent about my full appreciation and deep love for this district. Orchards was my first taste of evergreen. In fact, it solidified wanting to make sure my own children attend orchards for their educational experience. As a P3, I felt hopeful going into my appeal meeting and felt proud of my story I told in the informal setting with the superintendent and head of HR. Spoiler alert, I am still non-renewed. 
Instead of continuing the appeal process, I willingly accepted a job offer as a special education teacher at Legacy High School. I'm beyond excited to leverage my, leverage my strengths in service of their students. Legacy explicitly named that to their building, representation matters and that their historically underserved BIPOC students need to see a strong black female educator. This resonates with me. In my entire K through 12 student experience, I never had an educator who looked like me. I never truly understood the role of whiteness around me until I had my first impactful racialized experience in third grade. During our kinder buddy reading time, my buddy gently stroked the back of my hand and asked, are you black? I matter of factly replied, yes. She looked me dead in the face as she stated, I hate black people. In shock and disbelief, I rushed to Mrs. Dreyfus and recounted the exchange. Her response, oh, sweetie, she's only in kindergarten. She doesn't know what she's saying. Immediate invalidation. She wasn't my champion and my world shattered. As an adult, I can name that she couldn't address the racial issue because she did not have the correct tools in her toolbox. This year, it was my job to build capacity in educators to have empowering conversations around race. I contributed to design and facilitated the Creators Conversations Around Race, CCAR PD experience for 100 paraeducators. I started designing two CCAR program tracks for nine different staff cohorts, roughly 350 participants, because the district-wide youth truth data shows that this must happen. I served on the District Equity, Equity Advisory Committee for two years and helped construct the adopted equity policy. This work is necessary. I remain hopeful that Evergreen will, Evergreen will continue to build champions for all of our students. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Glad you're at Legacy. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next up is uh, Brooke Eddington. I think you're in the audience, right? Hi, Brooke. All right, I'll start it off. Um, I'm McKenna Pulling, a fifth grade teacher at Pioneer Elementary. I'm Brooke's teacher. Today, you'll be hearing a letter written by her. Um, I'm excited to help elevate her voice on a topic she felt passionate about. In February, we celebrated Women's History Month by learning about influential women in American history. One of these women was Claudette Colvin. Several students became interested in her story and we had multiple discussions about her and her role in the civil rights movement. A few months later in April, we began our interactive read aloud text set on exploring rights and citizenship. This text set includes several books about Rosa Parks. Brooke questioned why Claudette Colvin wasn't represented in these books. She was frustrated by the lack of representation and wanted to express it to someone. I suggested she write a letter to our district literacy specialist, who also happened to be my best mentor when I was a first year teacher, <laughs> Leanne Strickler. Um, I'm, and this was the result. I'm so proud of Brooke and how she used her voice to speak up. Now Brooke is going to read you her letter that she wrote to Leanne, as well as the letter she received back. <laughs> Uh, on March 2nd, uh, 1955, Claudette Colvin took the bus home from high school. She took a seat and was ordered by the bus driver to move. Claudette, Claudette refused, saying she paid her bus fare and had a right to be there. Her story is much like Rosa Parks because Rosa Parks was told to copy her. The color... Uh, the community believed she was too young to represent the colored community, so they had Rosa redo it. I think that children should learn about Rosa and Claudette, Rosa and Claudette because they're both important, and it saddens me to see Claudette be left in the dust, mainly because she inspired the boycott. So I think we should make it a requirement for teachers to read books about Rosa and Claudette. Sincere, sincerely, Brooklyn Eddington Pioneer Elementary School. <laughs> you got this. 
Do you want to read this part? Uh, Miss Strickler wrote me a letter back and gave me two books about Claudette. I was surprised when I got them because I wasn't expecting it. I felt proud because I had the courage to speak up and write the letter. <laughs> All right, this is the letter that she received from Leanne afterwards. Dear Brooklyn, thank you so much for your letter. You helped me learn a lot about Claudette Colvin that I didn't know before, and I love learning. We should always be adding good books to our library. Sadly, I can't buy copies for all of the fifth grade all of our fifth grade classrooms because there are 85 of them in Evergreen. However, I can buy them for you. You can share them with your class, other classrooms at Pioneer, or take them home and have them at your house. They are yours now. Thank you again for your letter, and I would love to learn even more about Claudette if you want to write back. Have a wonderful day, Mr. Ms. Strickler. I want to close by saying thank you for listening to our story. And thank you to Ms. Strickler for acknowledging Brooke's voice. By working together as learners, educators, and leaders, we can continue to elevate student voices across the district and show students that they are heard and can positively impact our school communities. Thanks. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you, Brooke, for joining us this evening. We appreciate that. All right, next up is, is it uh, Rana? Raina? Can you know, go ahead and come on up? We did send ahead a few documents. Mm -hmm. that yes. We have them. Mm -hmm. awesome. yes. okay. Good evening, Superintendent Boyd and members of the school board. My name is Raina Luchin Wall. I have been a school counselor at Burton Elementary for the last five years. With me today is Sarah Lang. She is a first year school counselor who spends her time half time at Burton and half time at Crestline. Not with us today is Christine Hill. Christine has been a school counselor at Crestline for eight years. We are here today to thank you for your support and to share information about the positive impact a second counselor has made in our elementary schools. In the last bargaining session between the district and the union, contract agreements were made to add a 0.5 FTE ESA, choice of a school psychologist or a school counselor, or a social worker, or a board certified behavior analyst to our high poverty elementary schools, with additional ESAs expanding to all elementary buildings this following year. The administrators and teachers at Burton and Crestline overwhelmingly agreed that we needed an additional school counselor. So we were able to hire myself as that part-time at both buildings. Together, as a result of having two school counselors with smaller caseloads this year, we have been able to significantly increase our direct services to the students at both Burton and Crestline. Both schools were able to assess student needs through brief individual interviews, minute meetings that take about seven minutes per student within the first month of school. The early student data collection and analysis allowed for proactive planning of tiered interventions and supports as we work to close the achievement gap and develop our comprehensive school counseling programs in alignment with SB 5030. Burton used the school counseling minute meeting data as part of a larger school improvement plan goal to increase our students' HOPE scores. The science of HOPE is, in over 20 years of research, showed that HOPE can best be defined as my future can be brighter than my past and I have the power to make it so. Research also showed that students who have an increase in HOPE performed up to two years better in their academic learning. As school counselors at Burton, we taught tier one classroom lessons on hope and helped students with goal setting. And we also worked on building students hope by helping students to identify their strengths. In addition, 12 students with low hope scores in the fall were chosen to participate in counseling small groups as an eight week tier two intervention. Students in these small groups raised their hope score by over five points, which resulted in an increase of 119%. Fourth grade students at Burton received the greatest number of individual and small group counseling sessions in our school. They also had the largest increase in hope in any grade level this year at Burton. 
Academic results from iReady testing show these same students made the largest gains in their performance in both reading and in math. According to the data from winter and spring, 63% of fourth grade students met a year's worth of growth in reading and 70% improved their math placement, moving up one performance level. At Crestlight Elementary, 24 students were able to receive targeted interventions to support their needs, which was an increase of nine students from our last fully in-person school year of 2018-2019. Intervention plans were tailored to each student's specific needs and were developed in the collaboration with the teacher, the instructional coach, a school counselor, as well as the special education staff and intervention staff and our language specialists. Throughout the year, based on that student data, adjustments were be able, we were able to make um, as needed to best serve our students. Of these students, 67% showed progress growth, whereas 33% were found to be in need of additional support, and so we were able to refer them for further evaluation to our special education team. We believe our increased services to our students and families at this critical post-pandemic time benefited not only our students, but also our teachers, our staff, and ad our administrators. Our impact supported students' social, emotional growth and development and mental health, but also had a positive impact on academic achievement and helped to close the achievement gap. Our shared efforts increased outcomes for our building goals for wellness, equity, stakeholder voice, student self-efficacy, and hope, all of which directly impact academic growth. We are excited about our first year results, so we wanted to share them with you and would ask that you please take the time after the board meeting to review the documents and the handouts that we've provided to you. We also ask for your continued support for the use of more than one school counselor or ESA in our elementary buildings. There really is no better time and no greater opportunity to meet the overwhelming needs that we are currently facing in our schools. Thank you for your time and for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. I had a chance to kind of look through them and it definitely was a significant growth in the number of children that were supported by you all. So it was good work. Thank you for coming and sharing with us tonight. This specifically for me was very clear. It felt amazing and we just wanted to share it. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Bill Bevel, come on up. <clears throat> All right. uh, Bill Bevel, um, this uh, is a bunch of benchmarks. Uh, this is not only um, last time I'll be here in this role at the school board meeting, because uh, <laughs> I'm going to come to all of them, but just not, no. Uh, but this is probably my last address I'll give as EA president. I saved it for you guys. Um, got my 25-year pen this year, uh, but my actual first job that I applied for in Evergreen was in uh, Chris Shergi's dirty little labyrinth office back with the wood paneling and the shag carpet in the very back of the district office. I applied to do a tech support job because it didn't look like I was going to get a teaching job. And uh, Chris turned me down. Uh, he says, no, it's like, I, I think you'll do better in the classroom. We want you to put you in the classroom. And uh, so uh, long story, well, a little shorter, I got my first permanent job at Sifton Elementary in 1997. And as I sat across from Sue Porter and Nina Askey and some of the people you might remember, uh, I was a very, very uh, audacious uh, uh, candidate. I, I looked them all in the eye and I told them I can bring this staff together. I was like, I was just some kid off the street, you know, uh, coming in to get a teaching job, but I told them I could bring them together. And I did. And that has been, I feel like, my, my strength in this role. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I feel like that's what I added. I'm so proud of the fact that we were able to work together through this time. I, I can't imagine what it would have been like if I didn't feel that we could collaborate together to make a decision. We came together, of course, to keep the staff and students of our school safe from COVID. Um, we came together just recently to pass the levy. You know, we all worked together on that. 
Um, I, we really did have to come together to do our, our to come together for our last CBA. Um, we were able to settle. We hadn't settled the CBA in June instead of in August with signs being made in a long time. And the fact that we were able to come come to an agreement on that was really important. Um, I'm also very grateful that you are uh, sending more counselors, psychologists, uh, BCBAs, and uh, psychs uh, next year to elementary schools. That extra um, support is really, really critical for our students. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm no Pollyanna. I know that we're going to have disagreements moving forward, of course. Uh, we're, we have important things to do. Um, but I feel very, very encouraged that if we have disagreements, we've set a standard uh, where we're going to talk about the ideas and talk about what it is that is important in our values and not so much in the personal attacks. I, I hope that I've laid a legacy that that's the way that we move forward. Um, I'm proud of my passion to insist that educators in this district be treated with first trust and then respect. And um, as I leave, I just have a couple things I wanted to leave with you. Obviously, it's been my pleasure to serve in this role. And as I join my rightful place with my colleagues at Emerald Elementary next year in fifth grade, I'm trusting you to keep that tradition uh, going and that we that I know that you will continue to put uh, students and our educators first because we know that our working conditions for educators in this district are also student learning conditions. And the other little thing is just a little bit from another guy named Bill. Um, the quality of mercy is not strained. It drops as gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It's twice blessed. It blesses those that give, those that receive. Thank you for your service to the students and families of Evergreen. Your work continues, uh, but for me, it's a sign of die. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. I'm gonna miss seeing those shirts. <laughs> this is like my last one. We can we can go visit him in his classroom, right? Yes, we can. Yeah. No sift in? Uh, no. <laughs> Emerald's a pretty good I have school. Lots and lots of friends. I have, a, I have a great psychologist out at Emerald, uh, Tracy Barrows, who you may know has a role similar to yours. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that is the end of our public comments. Um, at this time, the board will go into a recess where we'll sign papers, and then we will reconvene in a board workshop where we will do elementary boundary committee changes proposal. Uh, we'll have a safety and security update, a legislative update. Uh, then we will adjourn and then go into an executive session where we will review the performance of a public employee. Thank you.
All right, we're going to get started and uh, get to our workshop. First up is the elementary boundary committee changes. Scott and Bobby are going to present those to us. I think they brought some special guests along with them as well. Hi, Scott. Hi. <laughs> well, members of the board and Superintendent Boyd, it's uh, a pleasure for Bobby and, Bobby and I to be with you again um, to, you know, again bring this very important work forward. And uh, Julie, as you mentioned, we do indeed have some very special guests with us, and really not guests at all, but the folks who who really right from the beginning dove in and engaged in this work. Um, we were blessed, uh, as we have been in the other two phases of the work, to have um, at the beginning of the work a very robust parent committee and then uh, participation in that over the course of the last several months uh, dropped off understandably a little bit with everything that's going on. But we had a, a core four group of people, three of whom were able to make it tonight to present, who really championed this work, did a great job uh, moving it forward. And Bobby and I have been very blessed to work with them and very pleased. And so really, without further ado, we're going to uh, turn the rest of the presentation over to the three of them in its entirety. They will introduce themselves as they come forth. And Bobby and I, of course, will remain to listen and also uh, be in a position to answer any questions that you may have at the end of that. So thank you. Hi, I'm Erin Nugent. I have three kids in the district, uh, well, two now, one graduated, <laughs> and one at Hearthwood Elementary. And we are here because we are parents that wanted to um, help the school board with their priorities of right-sizing the elementary schools and reducing the number of students in the portable classrooms. And then there are also some capacity changes that were noted that Burton and Mill Plain will be opening new buildings. So we wanted to make sure we adjusted for those changes as well. Hi, I'm Kara Kangas. I use she, her pronouns, and I... <laughs> Um, I have a daughter, Violet, at Fircrest Elementary. She's a first grader this year, and thank you for having us this evening. Um, so the work of the parent committee we formed at the end of November in 2021 and over the course of 10 meetings have been talking about what it would look like to change the boundaries of these six elementary schools. Uh, we first started off by establishing group norms and guiding principles so that we could rely on those as the rubric to making this plan. Um, after we determined the initial recommendations by the board, we um, put together three community forums to solicit feedback from parents and students and other community members. Two of these were virtual and one was in person at Fircrest Elementary. And after considering all feedback and looked at the two alternative proposals that were um, put forward by a parent with a student at Crestline, um, we're here tonight to present the recommendations to you. So our guiding principles, by using the Evergreen Public School Equity Lens, we wanted to first, number one, maximize safety to and from school. So that included including safe walking routes and bus stops and bus routes, and to consider natural and artificial boundaries such as highways and waterways. Also consider transportation time to and from school. So we didn't wanna turn a walking zone into a bus riding zone or vice versa. We also wanted to honor socioeconomic community and balance. So we didn't want to um, make sure that there was, you know, if there was a large population, they were not going to be changing to another school and make sure that it was kind of even across the board. We were also wanted to be aware and balance as possible the diversity of student populations. Again, same, um, didn't want to have a large group of any students moving from one school to another. We wanted to maintain continuity within neighborhoods and avoid patchwork quilts mapping and geographic community. So we didn't want any of those little squares that you see now that are just ever <laughs> other schools um, within one school's boundary zone. And as always affect as few families as possible in this work. So I want to take a moment. My name is John Vanderken. Um, I have a uh, grandson at Burton Elementary School and had four children that went through the Evergreen School District uh, prior. So I uh, want to take a, a few minutes to walk through the current um, attendance zones and then the proposed attendance zones. 
And so uh, first one we're looking at here is Burton. So this is the current um, attendance zone for Burton. And then what we're proposing, this black line represents the current zone. The green circle here is approximately where the new school will uh, reside. And uh, then this would all um, be a um, new boundary for Burton. Um, uh, oh, excuse me. There was a um, uh, change for um, Burton. Let's see if I can go back here. So uh, one of the things we noticed, and we'll, I'll talk about it just pointed out briefly at the end uh, as one of the um, alternate uh, uh, proposals, uh, the group itself figured out that when we originally drew this new line down 129th, that we had it stop, and yet there's an apartment complex at the end of uh, 129th right here. And so what you see here is we had the, the proposed boundary, the one that went out to the public, that was out there for public feedback and so forth, showed the line going, continuing down what it's, it says here on the map is Northeast 129th, when in reality, this is a big apartment complex. So we essentially split the apartment complex unknowingly. The good news is that once we went back and looked at it, there are no elementary children uh, residing in the west side of that apartment complex, so it didn't really change any of the numbers, uh, but we wanted to make sure that as we brought it forth today that we had a properly um, uh, designated boundary that took that whole apartment complex into uh, Burton as it should. So moving on, uh, this is Endeavor's current attendance zone. You can see that there is um, some boundary for Fircrest that is within um, Endeavor's area. Um, this one got captured by uh, Burton, the proposed boundary for Burton. And then as we move forward, this is how we propose um, the new boundaries for Endeavor. You can see the portion that was Fircrest um, has been moved into Endeavor. And then as I said, we picked up that other part here with um, Burton's boundary being moved. So moving on to Fircrest and Hearthwood, um, just because the way they lay out, we kind of laid them together in this, this group. So again, the current view for Fircrest is over here, which also includes what I just described up in Endeavor, and then um, Hearthwood, as you see. So moving on to Fircrest, we've laid this out in two areas for the proposed. Uh, Fircrest North, because we have proposed that um, this section of Endeavor that is west of 112th Street is currently being bused to, to in, um, uh, Endeavor, uh, that that part of, of Endeavor's current boundary now go to Fircrest and be bused to Fircrest. Fircrest South, then, is really um, a change here, bringing um, Hearthwood um, into some of what was the, the boundary for Fircrest. And then as we go to Hearthwood, you can see it more clearly here. This was the, the current boundary for Hearthwood, and we're suggesting that um, Hearthwood expand out um, into this area. So moving on to Crestline, this is Crestline's current attendance zone. Our proposal for Crestline is to move kind of this, this current boundary into Mill Plain. And then Mill Plain's current um, attendance zone and the proposed attendance zone for Mill Plain. So what does all this mean? Uh, these are the numbers. So the August 2022 uh, numbers currently you can see in, in Endeavor has a, a very significant uh, student population. So uh, brings up Burton by uh, 94, approximately 94 students, reduces Crestline by about 64, and please make note of that number. We'll come to, back to that in a moment. Um, reduces Endeavor by 170. 
Um, Fircrest goes up by 44, Hearthwit goes up by 32, and Mill Plain up by 64. So through the process, as um, was earlier mentioned, um, we had uh, two alternative uh, proposals that were uh, sent in uh, by the same parent, as well as what I mentioned earlier around uh, the committee's own work with the 129th Street boundary. So the top one here is really the committee's work. I already addressed that earlier, um, which was incorporating that whole apartment complex versus splitting it in half. The um, first um, alternative was to um, adjust the proposed boundary between Crestline and Mill Plain so that it came uh, south down Park Crest to Southeast 15th Street, then east down 15th to Briarwood and back to Crestline from McGilvery. And so an example of that, if I can do this right, is it would come down here to Park Crest, come to 15th, and I want to say, yeah, and then come down here. And so all of this that you currently see, you know, west, that is purple, the proposal was to keep that in Crestline. Um, the problem that uh, the, the committee had with that is, um, one, was that would result in approximately 15 students being moved from Crestline to Mill Plain instead of the currently proposed 64. And so as we look at the space we're trying to create in Crestline and the available space coming in from Mill Plain with the new building, we just didn't think that met with the original tenant of trying to capitalize on and utilize the um, available space that was uh, being generated in Mill Plain. The second proposal was um, use the proposed route down Park Crest but once down to Briarwood, go east, uh, back up Blair Mount, and down 15th uh, Street to Briarwood, and back south to McGilvery. And let me see if I can describe that here. So again, uh, Park Crest, and I believe it was something like, I believe it was down Briarwood here and came back this direction. And so essentially uh, moving a, a smaller portion of this purple area back into Crestline or keeping it within Crestline, I should say. Again, the, uh, that one was a, a little bit better, but as, again, we looked at the, the numbers, it would result in approximately 30 students or less than half of the students that were proposed uh, moving from Crestline to Mill Plain. And so in looking at that, it wasn't just about the numbers of students. Um, we also had concerns around um, uh, density too. If I recall, and uh, my colleagues here can jump in, there is an apartment complex, uh, higher density in here, and there are a number of high density um, housing units within the Crest Line um, boundaries currently. And so in our um, opinion that also by making the recommendations that we proposed that also took one of those high density um, housing complexes and moved it into Mill Plain um, which does not have nearly as many um, high density uh, um, housing um, areas as Crestline or some of the other um, uh, districts or um, uh, boundaries. So coupling that together, we felt like um, those two um, alternatives, while we appreciated them, we, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't find a way for them to really line up with um, the guiding principles that were in place, what, what the board was looking for, and then the guiding principles that we had in terms of uh, making the decisions. Any questions? I'm sorry, Grub, you can go ahead. It was about the uh, um, um, Fircrest, I think, 
uh, proposal between 18th and 39th east of 205 to 112th. How many um, how many families or students um, were in that north section that would come away from? Is it, let's see. Uh, it's farther uh, down. Trying to get the same page. That would come away from for, okay. from Endeavor. Right. Uh, so. To be clear, Rob, just to make sure we're clear, what you're asking is how many students are in this area here that is being proposed to move away from Endeavor? Right. I know there's a lot of commercial property and light industrial in that space, but uh, I don't know how many kids live there. 136. You're moving 136 from Endeavor to Fircrest with this proposal? Um, in that area. In that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other factor at play there, as John uh, covered, and we could show you a graphic if you like, but John mentioned um, that rather large patchwork quilt that's currently for Crest mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, essentially part of it overlooks Endeavor. Um, there are approximately 100 students in that area, um, roughly half of which already attend Endeavor on boundary exceptions. So, so they would stay and then it would affect you know, the others that are shifting um, with transportation, that would be the, the key thing there. Did you receive any feedback from families who live there um, in the North Flag that's proposed for Fircrest? In the, I'm sorry, Rob, in, in oh, in this uh, area 18th here? 18th to 39th. Right here? West of 112th, yeah. Was there any feedback offered by those families? Uh, we had um, some parents that, uh, live in that area, I think three or four of them from that area that attended one of the virtual forums, the one that was um, interpreted in Spanish by mm -hmm. Adriana Garcia. Um, and the feedback that, that she got and then um, shared with us was limited to, you know, basically thanking the committee for sharing the information and making sure that it was accessible to them, but no specific feedback for or against. Okay. Yeah, the questions were primarily uh, uh, confirming the boundary exception process. Mm -hmm. And that, um, where Countryside Woods is at, I think that's in the Mill Plain. Is that in the Mill Plain boundary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you see yep. it? Yeah, there it is. Is that the develop? <laughs> is that development split? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's been that way. This has been the boundary that we've currently had. Um, it's hard because Hearthwood is so small and Mill Plain is so small to try to get them even. And because that's all housing um, and not high, there's no high density uh, apartment complex or complexes or anything in there. Um, it's been that way since, I don't know when the last boundary change was for We're talking right, right up in here. Go to Harmony, but that's right when oh, blue and green. Right, right. long time ago. Right. <laughs> yeah, we we left that area alone. It uh, that that was part of the obviously the current boundary that's been established and uh, and has been in place at least since this work began in the three phases and probably longer. Okay. It looks much cleaner. The blocks of space, and we've needed to fix that Endeavor problem for a really long time um, because all those apartments that went in when the school was already at capacity and then the need to move them to Fircrest, and so this really solves that. And uh, Cimarron doesn't have that little patch that used to be there. That used to be a Columbia side. Valley. Yeah, it was a funny one. Funny thing. That was like was... one cul-de-sac or something, yeah. That was part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We also looked at um, there are some high density housing that are being planned for this area where um, actually where Joe's Place Farms used to be, and then right through here. So both housing complexes, apartment complexes, will be multi generational housing. So we anticipate those families, if they have children, will go into Fircrest. Um, not sure if they'll be, I think this is a bus line now. They've seen buses pick up kids on 112th Avenue. Um, we did notice that the apartments that are opening here on this plot of land, we did some research and these are only one bedroom units. They will not have two or three bedroom <coughs> units. 
and the entering costs for these one bedroom units are pretty high. Um, so while apartments generally attract multi-general housing, this specific complex is not. So um, we figured that if we kept this boundary here for Endeavor on the off chance that there are smaller households that move into these apartments that um, they would appropriately go to <coughs> Endeavor. So on the Crestline counter proposal, it, just making sure I understand that, that the uh, proposals uh, that the committee didn't accept, yes, that uh, that's Blandford, Mountain View, and one apartment complex. Um, little There's a large apartment complex right mm -hmm. here um, before you reach Mountain View. Okay. And uh, one of the proposals included this apartment complex to go to Mill Plain, and the other one did not. The one that um, had 15 students did not include that apartment complex. And then the only at uh, the one proposal that didn't include it was cut right here. So it was just sending this small group to Mill Plain. Did, uh, did the person proposing it give any reasoning for the proposal or? Uh, they have a child at Crestline that would go to Mill Plain. Mm -hmm. They wanted their house not to be included in that change. How are boundary exceptions shaping up in that part of the district these days? Well, of late, Rob, as you might suspect, um, due to the sad fact of declining enrollment, there is, um, and with ESSER funds during the pandemic, class sizes you know, in the last couple of years have been pretty low. So uh, to the best of my memory, we did not um, deny a single boundary exception last year moving into this year, nor did we deny any throughout the course of the school year. Um, you know, things will be a little bit different next year with regard to staffing, given, you know, the cuts that Superintendent Boyd has talked about and the need to, I guess, equalize staffing. Um, however, the additional classroom spaces in almost all of our elementary schools does remain because of that declining enrollment. So, so the conversation that has yet to occur with Superintendent Boyd will be, you know, what will our position be with regard to the sheer number of those and do we stick with the same methodology of saying yes to all or to as many as possible and then adjusting or do we need to look at that a little bit differently? So those are conversations that, to have in the that makes sense? Yes, it does. Um, and uh, just to close out that thought, and I think we mentioned this before, I mean, if space is available, our goal is always to say yes to a request a parent makes because they all have their reasons for making that request. And so if we're able to say yes, we will. And of course, we also know, you know, given the way board policy and procedure is, which mirrors, you know, the laws of the state as well, that, um, it's required as it should be that you must say yes to uh, boundary exception requests that are in district before you can even rule yes or no on requests from outside the district. Right. And we, of course, when the situation warrants it, um, of course, are very invested in or interested in saying, saying yes to as many out of district boundary exception requests as we can because mm -hmm. that brings enrollment to us. So, so that part remains the same. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or? I just have four words, you're hired and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great work. I know this is hard. I've been on one of those committees years ago and it's never fun, but it's, it's better than the old process used to be where it was just a top down from administration and they did it and everybody just had to accept it and then we were all mad at board meetings. So um, I uh, appreciate the work that you've put into this and the thoughtfulness about it. Yeah, Thank you for the that. research too and, and really the consideration of neighborhoods because that's what you always hear about like, oh, just the house behind us goes to the school, you know, the, on the other side. And so it's like that thoughtfulness of knowing which developments are going to be coming and mm -hmm what neighborhoods could be affected and trying to keep those kids together because that really does make sense. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be interested later to learn how many portables we were able to retire. Yeah. Thank you. 
that that will be some good data. A lot of them. Yeah. 67. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> Don't quote me because my numbers are getting trouble. We'll ask Sue when she comes in. I'm going to hold, it, hold you to it. Sue and no. Jennifer. Right there. Is that the numbers? <laughs> All right, so next, uh, safety and security update. Uh, Sue Steinbrenner, Shane Gardner are gonna. Yeah, as, as, as our team is uh, filing up here and uh, preparing for the presentation, this uh, presentation came as a result of some inquiries by the board after the unfortunate uh, shooting in Uvalde, Texas uh, at Robb Elementary. Uh, we, um, after that event, uh, fielded call after call after call after call, divided and conquer. I think at one point there were 12 or 13 of us answering questions and reassuring people um, about our methodologies and our, our safety and security systems. The Much of the focus of the conversation and the calls was related to the physical building. Um, uh, and so I asked Sue to put together a presentation to talk mainly about that, but you can't talk about that without talking about uh, the affective side and some of the measures that we do just in terms of our safety and security protocol. So Shane, Kyle, and, and Sue will be taking us through um, a quick presentation. Uh, one other caveat that we could do, you know, two full day workshops on safety and security. We're really doing a high, high level summary um, of both the building and the security measures that we institute here across the district. Well, good evening, uh, Shane Gardner. I'm the uh, Director of Safety and Security. I haven't had an opportunity to officially meet you yet. Welcome aboard, it's nice to meet you and um, Superintendent and Board. Um, so <clears throat> this is gonna be a high level presentation. We're uh, not going to get into the details. It's not our intention. Uh, we're happy to do that at any time with any one of you, but for the purpose of today, we just wanted to uh, do exactly what it says in a brief overview and reassure all of you. Um, I know that you all have been asked questions by families also and constituents that uh, this is a topic that uh, we've put a lot of thought into and we do all the time, even before the incident that occurred in Texas and uh, take an opportunity also, um, this is Kyle Olson, he's our manager of safety and security, he's been with Evergreen now for, uh, since March, uh, and he'll be getting up and present also, but uh, Kyle has uh, um, over 12 years of law enforcement experience, and then he came to us from Portland Public Schools where he spent the last three and a half years as the senior manager of safety and security. So, uh, and you know Sue Steinbrenner, um, so, and uh, you know, one thing about uh, what we're gonna cover, I'm just gonna talk real quickly, the foundational awareness, current events, national, local, and just kinda where we're at. And I'm not gonna read all these slides, so uh, you've been presented with them and uh, can read them as I talk, but just one thing is, as we talk about safety and security and when it comes to violence in schools, I just wanna draw you know, the contrast between some of the safety things we do with the fire marshal. In 1958 in Chicago, there was a fire that killed 95 kids. And since that happened, zero children have died in school fires. Uh, we know that we can't occupy our buildings until they pass fire code. They have fire suppression systems. They have emergency exit lights that are even battery backup so that if the power gets cut, it still will work, we have uh, fire extinguishers, fire pole stations, and we pay the fire marshal to come through our buildings and inspect them all the time. We also do fire evacuation practices, uh, and, and we have um, rules on how we can build our schools. Some of our elementary schools, for example, Riverview, some of our classrooms don't have doors, and that's because of fire egress requirements for um, fire code. So it's, there are times when fire code um, doesn't necessarily complement uh, violence prevention in our schools, and, and that's just where we're at. That's uh, the, what we're operating in. Um, Sue will talk about the safety design systems, built environment. 
uh, since I've been here, her and I have been collaborating and now we've had the opportunity because of the bond to build all these new buildings and start from the ground up. And so instead of retrofitting things, uh, and she'll talk to you about the committees that we had because we put a lot of thought into the way that we designed our buildings. And then Kyle will briefly um, talk about some of the other parts of safety and security that go into it, our people, our processes, um, partnerships that we have. So, um, you know, um, we don't want to sound callous as we talk about these things. We understand that there are people that are personally affected by gun violence in this country. Uh, in the 16 years I worked for Clark County Sheriff's Office, two of my coworkers' children were killed by guns in the homes. It's um, a part of um, our culture today. We know that we have about 330 million people in the United States and there's over 4 million guns in the country. We, a couple years ago, teenagers became more likely to be killed by guns than in car accidents. So uh, gun violence is prevalent in what we're doing. But specifically as we talk about this, you know, active shooters are things that uh, we see on the news that are happening at concerts and at movie theaters and grocery stores. And it's a thing that we all have to put thought into. We can't not put thought into. And as we talk to our principals about OODA loop, we apply it to the real world principles of this isn't just a school thing. This is when you're at the movie theater. This is when you're at the grocery store. We always have to have that situational awareness. And then we'll also talk specifically about what that looks like in a school. And for the data, when we're looking at research, and unfortunately, we have reams and reams, and uh, 23 years ago, the Columbine happened. Nine years ago, Sandy Hook happened. Um, yeah, I mean, we have these events that give us statistics and data that we can look back on. Um, it, but some of the data, you know, you have to read the fine print because, for example, in this K-12 database that we used, it included every instance that a gun was brandished or fired or that a bullet hit a school property from something that happened outside of the school. So putting in context the data that we're looking at is important, which is why we wanted to talk about the difference between a school shooter and an active shooter because sometimes those conversations blend and leak into each other and as we're talking about data, Specifically to school shooters, uh, and this is the challenge that we have, and this is why here at Evergreen Public Schools, um, our campus security, for example, they don't carry handcuffs, they don't carry tasers. Their job is to build relationships. That everything that we do in the school is based on voluntary compliance, and anything beyond that becomes a law enforcement issue. We all ask somebody to leave, but we're not outfitted to tackle them and put them into handcuffs, and that's a law enforcement issue. So we do what we do by building relationships and we try to get to know as many of the kids as we can so those kids feel comfortable coming to us and talking to us about their friends. Because we know that while there's no profile for a school shooter, we know that 75% uh, of the historic shooters have felt bullied. So we want to reduce bullying in our schools, which will reduce the chance that a, a kiddo um, feels ostracized and decides to do some of these. 93% uh, engage in some behavior prior that caused others to be concerned. Again, relationships. If a friend of a kid sees that a kid is spiraling or posting something on social media, we want them to feel comfortable to be able to come talk to all of our staff, not just campus security. So, and unfortunately, the median age of school shooters is 16, but you can see by that graph that uh, they can go all the way up to the Nicholas Cruz's and the 18 years old or what we just had in Uvalde with 20 years old. It, it happens. Um, one of the things when we do our practices and our tabletop drills with our schools, we talk to them about it can happen here. And it's a sad reality, but I don't want anybody to think it can't happen here. And too often on the news, I hear people saying, I never thought it would happen here. And we do our practices, which we call them practices, whether it's a fire evacuation drill or something for a weather event or a lockdown or a lockout. We do them as practices rather than drills because our brains engage the entire time. We're preparing for a situational based. For example, instead of just pulling the fire alarm and exiting the building and seeing how quickly we can get it done, we have a scenario based. Is it a grease fire in the kitchen? If so, then we couldn't evacuate going by the kitchen. Or is it an electrical fire by a ballast of one of the lights, which would mean we couldn't exit that direction. 
So we try to build our practices scenario-based so that every time we're taking away from education, we're still doing education. It's just practice for real-world events that could happen. So unfortunately, uh, over time, things aren't getting better. Uh, our schools are microcosms of the community. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I saw a headline that said that there were 10 shootings in 10 hours in the Portland metro area. We know that we've taken firearms off students in our schools. We've had uh, gun violence happen that's uh, really near our schools. We've had um, guns taken from students in neighboring districts. It's not specific to where we're living here. It's a sign of the time. In fact, uh, as I was uh, preparing for this and reading, I saw that in May there were two elementary schools in Washington State, elementary schools where students brought guns to school in Washington State in May. I hadn't even heard that in the news. One was up uh, near Kitsap uh, County and the other was over in Spokane. It's unfortunate that they have the availability to take these things and put them in backpacks and bring them to school, but uh, it is something that's happening more frequently. Um, so when this question where the rubber hits the road of what are we doing uh, to prevent, part of it are the, uh, the softer considerations that Kyle's gonna talk about, about the building relationships, about threat assessments and some of those things, and others are about just the way that we do business. How do our schools present? What does that look like? Um, I've had conversation with parents that wanted taller fences, that fences can hold people in also during an emergency. So our fences are to delineate space. I don't wanna to take too much of, of Sue's thunder in the way that we've put thought into this, but many conversations I've had with parents where they're asked questions of why don't you do it this way when we explain the rationale and there is rationale behind the way that we do things. Uh, so far, all of those have said, I understand now why you're doing it the way that you do it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sue. Thank you, Shane. So in May of 2019, in preparation for the bond, we had a safety and security workshop with parents, students, I think the mayor attended, we had community people, and really kind of developed a, a framework of the strategies we were gonna use in our safety and security. A lot of that is really developing a common vocabulary around what safety means, because it's something different to some people than it is to others. So you can see there kind of what our um, what our framework includes. If you look at that link on the bottom, when you have a chance, I would encourage you to open that up and look in the appendix. One of the questions we asked the committee was, where do you feel safe? What kind of a space makes you feel safe? And the common answer was peaceful, serene, calm. It was not metal detectors or you know, um, some of the more some of the physical things, barbed wire fencing that you you, you might hear about. Um, we think of safety and security kind of in concentric rings of control, and we're not going to stop if it, God forbid, it happens to us. We just want to slow them down and give people a chance to react and delay. It's just another layer, so it's multiple layers of security. You think about that perimeter as kind of your fence that Shane mentioned. Um, then you have the exterior from the fence, the grass, the grounds, to the building, and then you get to the entrance and then you're inside. Um, so really thinking of multiple layers of defense to give our people more time to respond. Um, I kind of, I, I don't wanna read all of this to you. Shane mentioned on the fencing, we've been intentional about four foot high uh, fencing with clear signage denoting this is the expectations when you walk on campus. And some of that is legal statutes, no smoking, no vaping, no drugs, but it's also got the trespassing language. Checking in at the main office, we were very intentional in the signage to make it be welcoming and not put no, I mean, when you went, Prior, it's like, don't do this, don't do that. There was a sign that listed all the things you couldn't do. Um, th there's a little note at the bottom, Shane mentioned it, 63% of the victims in school shootings are actually not in the school. So we don't wanna put a 12 foot high fence that traps kids in. We can also use the gates. The exterior, um, a lot of that is just clear sight circulation, adequate lighting, 
really a more passive surveillance of being able to see. We keep our vegetation low to make sure that it's not growing too high and you can't see out. The entrance to the building is a secure entrance. It's not what uh, some districts have done, a sally port, where you can't get into the building without being buzzed in. We intentionally avoided that in Evergreen because we felt that the secretary should not be making a judgment based on what somebody looks like when they're outside the building. And so often, someone may be fine outside. They come inside the building, and they have an interaction you know, what do you mean my ex picked up the kid and it, it gets blown out of proportion? They're already in. So the secure vestibules that we've created through the bond keeps them at the main office. It keeps them from penetrating into the building, which is what, unfortunately, Sandy Hook did not have that. They had the vestibule outside. The guy broke in through the window, got in, and then he had access to the heart of the building. Um, we also... Uh, reduce the number of exterior doors in the um, new prototypes. And you think about COVID, COVID really reversed that. We went to a lot of several entrances just because we couldn't get everyone lined up in front of the, the main entrance. Once you're on the inside, um, we wanted a community space that can be a resource. Um, I would encourage you at the end, I put in a link to a TED talk about a guy that was almost a school shooter. And he talks about not being able to take showers and have access to clothes. He'd been in 30 or 40 different schools, had kind of deadbeat parents. And he really struggled to try and fit in. He got bullied. Um, it was a real powerful um, video for me to watch. And so that community space is super important. Like Shane said, we have all the, you know, the PA system and the classroom doors we can lock from the inside. But that softer side of trying to make buildings that don't, that discourage bullying, that we made the hallways at Y East wider, because you don't want middle schoolers with their backpacks bumping into each other. Um, I get a lot of questions about the windows. Natural light is really therapeutic and calming, but people get afraid because they think they, they can see my kids in there. It's, it's part of um, SEPTEB, which is crime prevention through environmental surveillance or environmental design natural surveillance, the ability to see out. If you hear shots and you can't see where they're coming from, you don't know where to go. And that actually happened at Tim Lauer in a building in the 70s when he was here. He shared, he heard the shots in Portland, but he, he had nowhere to, nowhere, he didn't know where to run. It's also the ability for law enforcement to see in, to see what's happening on the inside of the building. Of course, we have shades that you can pull down and turn off the lights if you need to um, do a lockout. Um, the other thing I really want to kind of um, talk about is the in engineer educate enforce. We do a lot of engineered. Our access control systems are super complicated and um, we teach people during drills how you work, how it works. This actually the enforcement picture is the day after the event in Texas. Got a, an email from John that someone had complained, our doors are not closing. So we sent our maintenance technician out there and it's propped open. So that's a layer that we don't have. But when you train, when that door do goes into lockdown, it closes and locks, your access card no longer works on it. You need an override card. So you think about during training, we wanna make sure that staff know, I won't be able to get in that door if I'm outside. Do I have an alternate route? Does the school have a plan to let kids in if they're outside, what's that plan look like? So we need to constantly be educating year to year, and that's what a lot of the drills are for. Um, I'll let it go from there. We did send, we are doing, um, collaborating with law enforcement, SWAT team, and fire at Mountain View and uh, Y East the next week to do some actual training in our buildings. So that real life training. We did send a notice out to the neighbors within 500 feet of the school just because we didn't want someone thinking it was a real event and have them go in there. So, Kyle, take it from here. Good evening, Director, Superintendent. So I'll kind of wrap it up and kind of just talk about, um, I think, the last kind of mitig mitigation strategy that we implement. But what I feel is the most important, um, you know, we were focusing a lot on the systems that we have here, physical security systems and what uh, we've put into the buildings and we'll continue to do so. But again, all of these are mitigation strategies that are layered on top of each other to help 
you know, to help as best as possible to prevent something from happening or somebody from doing something or to, to make the odds in our favor to for us to come across a student or situation that may happen to get in front of that. So that's really the, the, the most important and crux part that we're trying to get across here. And this kind of slide shows you one thing I, I try to do whenever I hear of like a school shooting, right? And, and I appreciate the delineation between an active shooter and school shooting. If you just look up the, the statistics, right, there's been a school shooting in Washington already in 2022, and that was on the, on, um, the eastern side where a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old got into a fight in the parking lot, and they both had firearms, and one was critically wounded. So when you hear of an event like that, I fear, what, what could we have done to stop that, right? Would a lockdown procedure have helped stop that? Would a uh, reinforced door help to have stopped to, to make that happen? And you can keep going back years and years of just school shootings, specifically, our, you know, in our state, right, that has impacted us. And almost all of them, when you start to go down, it's, it's events that happened either outside the school or with students that are being impacted just by gun violence, uh, gang involvement, um, or it's even adults that are attending games, athletic events, or something like that, where there's a fight, there's an altercation, a weapon's involved, and shots fired. So... When we talk about, when we see an, an active shooter event that happens in Texas and you have all these like, what are you doing to prevent this? That's a worst case scenario, but really looking what happens routinely, or not routinely, but what happens in our state are these shootings that are chalked up at data that all these school shootings are happening when the, it's, it's hard to prevent that, right? It's an, our schools are impacted by the, the, the gun violence that's in the community. And so it's a broader picture of like, how can we prevent the gun violence from coming into our school buildings, which is a really tough, tough answer. And, and so we put these systems, these physical systems in place to help that. Um, but the biggest, I think, mitigation strategy that we have uh, is our personnel, our protocols, our plans and our responses. Uh, so just to go quickly over this and we can, if there's ever any questions about going deeper into some of these plans and, and processes, we are happy to um, go over that with with you, but we have uh, myself and Shane, the director and manager um, that oversees uh, all the schools with uh, nearly 30 years of law enforcement experience and, and SRO experience specifically, um, 32 campus safety personnel, so four in, in the comprehensive high schools and two in our middle schools. Each school has a site-specific emergency operation plan that's updated yearly and, and, and shared with our local first responders to help um, collaborate and have a good response when ever responding to any kind of emergency in our building. Each school has their site emergency teams and as well as a district emergency response team um, that are able to quickly respond and address any situation that are, is happening in our schools. Again, the continued reinforce of safety training for all staff, um, really helping each staff identify their role and what they play and to pre helping prevent uh, an incident in our schools. Again, as we, we've noticed that um, each, each person has a, a, a link to each student and can know when something's going on, um, when to address something and how to make others uh, aware so we can help be in front of any potential incident. Uh, monthly drills, exercise, tabletop, and scenarios that we continue to go through to help kind of reinforce our plans and our response and actions. Um, and then again, uh, school-specific district and community teams to address any con concerning situations. So threat assessments on the site level. We do threat assessments with community partners um, to, to speak and talk about students of concern. Um, we have youth engagement teams, um, a HIB process where uh, bullying or harassment can be reported so we can address that again, in an effort to stay in front of any kind of situation that, that may happen, or any student that's experiencing any kind of um, harassment or behavior that, that may yield them to make decisions that, um, you know, at, at like could be of a shooting that we want to prevent. Um, and then lastly, we're just looking to constantly update our systems and our plans and protocols and, and can, uh, going with our standards to um, standard response protocol and standard reunification method. Again, just looking to refine this, the tools and the systems that we have in place every year, how we can improve those and, and what can be addressed and changed and any gaps that we may have. So again, just 
our schools, we, we want them to be warm and inviting uh, environments because we want to promote an area for them for them to learn. Um, and that's always that balance of, of safety and learning. They're oftentimes at the end of the spectrum. Um, we got to find that middle ground where we can make sure that they're safe, but kids don't feel like they're kind of walking into a correctional facility or anything of that nature. We want them to feel like it's a, a community center. It, it's part of their community. It's got... Uh, you know, things that they're proud of, um, but it's also warm and inviting can learn, but they also feel safe. We, we understand that both those need to take place. So um, with that, uh, we're happy to answer any questions or um, if we missed anything. Anybody have any questions? I just have one. My question was about those, um, the key cards for overrides. Who's, whose key would work in that situation? So the, um, I think law enforcement has a key. The main office has an override key. And the reason we do that is we don't want the bad person, I would say bad guy, to steal an access card and then they have freedom to the kingdom. So it is intentional that only one card overrides. I know you have one. Yeah, I have one. I have an override. But with the system that we have, RS2, our access control, we also could communicate remotely. Uh, I can unlock any access control door in the district at the push of a button. So law enforcement, we intentionally with the design of the buildings also have access control doors on all four cardinal sides of a building. Uh, and that comes from our law enforcement background. If, uh, heaven forbid, there was a hostage situation like happened uh, in Europe a couple years ago, which lasted over a couple days, uh, we know that law enforcement wouldn't want to enter close to where the hostage takers are. They would probably want to enter from the far end of the building. So by having access control doors on all four corners or sides of the building, uh, if law enforcement decides to make entry, uh, they could call and then we'd buzz the door open. They'd be able to enter through it without alerting through loud banging, breaking of glass, any of that, the people inside that they're now coming in. So that's another uh, beauty of the system. But uh, when our SROs, when we had SROs in the district, they all had first responder cards. That's what we call the cards. It'll still work on a card swipe, but that's part of the lockdown. On, on a lockout, when a lockout occurs, where we're securing the perimeter, uh, all the card readers um, trigger. So mainly thinking of like an elementary school, the front door is unlocked during the day, but then the vestibule doors are locked. But in a lockout, that front door locks. Everybody entering the building needs a key card at that point. But think more like um, a wild animal on the property or a dog or something that doesn't belong. So the teachers in that case will come to the door, swipe, swipe their card. It'll grant them access and allow everybody to get in the building. Or if law enforcement was doing a search warrant in the neighborhood or something. Either way, it's safer to be back in the building with the lock down. Um, and the card reader is not working anymore, uh, the situation could transition into a run, hide, fight anyway. So coming back into the building might not be the safest for people. So with that card reader not working anymore would be a reminder to staff that I probably should go stand on the edge of the property just to wait to see what's happening next until I can gather some more information to figure out what, because the lockdown, everybody always goes to, it's the worst possible thing, but it could be an irate parent or an intoxicated parent in the office. It doesn't have to mean that violence is happening, but we're still going to do that lockdown just in case. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? I should say too, we in the bond completely rekeyed the entire district and Frontier is being added to the RS2 system this summer and, and everything else now will be on RS2, which is, we used to give a long time ago, we used to give master the great grands out like they were candy. There was no accountability, and we've reeled all that in and completely rekeyed everything. So now teachers don't have exterior keys; they have keys to the interior. Only a few people have an exterior key at the building, which is awesome. So someone, no, nobody who without those keys could go in the dead of night and right. try to do work at the building or whatever. Um, well, if they lose their card, too, we can just depro we can take it out of the system. So it, if it gets lost or stolen, where's mm -hmm. the master key? If you lose that, someone has a key to the kingdom. If that's uh, easier to administer than the metal keys, right? Mm -hmm. We, uh, no, I, I had a question and it fell out of my, <laughs> it fell out of my head. I apologize. There's a hand up. Question in the audience.
I think that goes back to that engineer educate enforce and that's good feedback to get back to the schools that you were at. I've been at schools where I didn't have my badge and they very politely said, hey, I noticed you didn't have a badge. Can we go to the front office and get you? So I, I think that's a, a reinforcing training and it's good to get that feedback back to the schools. I don't know if you have yeah, any. we're going to be dealing with uh, it's kind of the point that we're all making. Um, actually, I had a conversation with a superintendent um, when he first came because people like to say that safety and security is our highest priority. And when we say that, we set an unreal expectation because our highest priority is education. The only reason we take 2,000 hormones and put them under one roof is not for safety and security. We have to have safe and secure place for kids to learn. They can't learn unless they feel safe. But the reason we bring them together is for education. And we do have a lot of portables throughout this district, which are a single classroom with an exterior door. And kids are going to have to move from point A to point B. But with all the conversations I've had with parents about uh, why don't we have a metal detector at the, at the front, or why don't we have big fences that keep people away from the school, or you know, I counter with, uh, well, there been a shooting at a school with a metal detector, and the first person that was killed was the guy manning the metal detector because the student had a plan, just like most of the students do. They have a plan. Uh, it also happened at Terminal 3 down at L.A. Airport, which is home, Department of Homeland Security, and they um, circumvented the metal detectors there and went on a spree in the airport. Uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And if we know that the average age of a school shooter is 16, that means that the potential enemy is influenceable. We have an opportunity to reach them before they become a school shooter like the TED Talk, to make sure that they're seen, to make sure that they're not bullied, to make sure that they're heard, so that uh, the, the people that are, have, clearly have access to these weapons don't do that darkest, worst thing and bring it to one of our places where they have free reign of our schools anyways. They come and go as they, as they want. They walk among us. <coughs> um, so what we try to do is educate and engineer and enforce, and we do the best that we can. And if uh, somebody didn't... Um, contact somebody that was walking the school, I'd hope that that would be brought to somebody at the school's attention. But at the same time, the uh, threat isn't typically from um, an adult coming in off the street, wandering around, not knowing their way around. I know we have, I know we have some more things going on tonight. Are there, are there any other questions for? Just uh, wanna, I, I found my question, and I can ask you about SROs at a different time, but. Um, as I look at your framework with uh, external, internal self-harm, et cetera, um, is it the case, do you think, that the internal threats and self-harm outnumber uh, external threats, environmental threats? Um, as in there are more, there's more bullying than active shooters. There's Absolutely. The orders of magnitude seem to be pretty large uh, that we were talking about this after Parkland in uh, WASDA's legislative committee. Uh, and pointing out to one another that, yeah, we had a school shooting um, up in northern Washington. And that happens once or twice a year, but that uh, student suicide attempts are twice a week statewide. And uh, our focus, this holistic focus, seems to recognize that. That combined with the impression that I'm now getting from you that you're not just thinking about whether it'll happen, you're thinking about you're thinking about it as when it'll happen and uh, training everybody what to do. And I appreciate that, and especially 
uh, the social emotional elements and the addition of counselors and things, that's, uh, that's gonna impact someone years before they could become this violent. And it's good to see a recognition of that. So I'm off my soapbox. Um, thank you, thank you all. Thank you. All right, so next is legislative update. Rob, do you have anything? I, we're still waiting for the handbook to come out. We should probably schedule, uh, um, if the legislative, if the General Assembly is before our, uh, well, it's not before our first meeting in September, but that would be a good time for us to workshop and go through the book uh, that WASDA publishes and just identify the ones that are the most important to us. Uh, so that your friendly neighborhood red, ledge rep has the sense of the board on all that stuff. Um, as we were thinking about um, our budget reductions and so forth, I did a lot of looking into statute and it seems to me that there might be a way to advocate for equity in state law. Um, namely that treatment of provisional employees and, and uh, how rigid the state law is. Uh, and I wonder from uh, each of you or all of you uh, whether or not we could conceive of uh, advancing uh, sort of an emergency position on the matter uh, so that the state law could permit us to be more flexible in these circumstances. Um, that would need the concurrence of four other districts and I'm pretty sure I can get that and then it would be proposed to General Assembly as a legislative position and priority for uh, the statewide um, uh, the statewide association. But uh, kind of just wanted to broach the subject and see what you think. Yeah? So one of the things that I've wondered about, and this might be what you're talking about and I'm not, I don't know, but um, the state has, we now have legislation that mandates that we go through training, mm -hmm. equity training. And so we've taken that first step um, with it, plus all the work that we've done here. But the, but the state isn't funding anything for us to do the work that they are training us to be leaders in. And that's the piece that I think, um, is that what you're talking about, is some kind of funding so that some of these positions can be funded and yeah, they aren't so vulnerable to... They took some action with school counselors that actually mm -hmm. permit us greater latitude with counselors, psychologists, social workers mm -hmm. at each of our schools and there's a funding injection for that uh, that came out of the last legislative session. What I was thinking about was the, uh, the rigidity of statute around uh, provisional employees. You can hire a 20-year experienced teacher uh, and if they're in the first year uh, working for this district they're a provisional employee and we stand to lose them based on things um, that might be negotiable um, with our staff but uh, really the statute drove a lot of the decision making uh, and just coming to discover that this afternoon uh, makes me wonder if we need a change in the law in order to retain uh, teachers who look like our students, staff members who look like our students, uh, if an equity lens could be uh, promoted to the legislature uh, for them to examine those kinds of laws and propose some changes, uh, it'd be nice to have WASDA on that side, especially given our equity, WASDA's equity statements and mm -hmm. the positions of the association as a whole. So that's on my mind. And I could probably, you know, try and draft something. You know, Wazda shall initiate and and or support legislation that. Um, whatever it is we'd want it to say, but I think there are other districts who would sign on, in and out of the Puget Sound area. We could make it a real statewide thing. And hope to carry this conversation into the legislature as well. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Just let me know. All right, thanks, Rob. Do you have anything, John, to add? Okay, um, we're going to adjourn the meeting. We're going to go into an executive session to review the performance of a public employee. It's expected to last about an hour. Thank you.